farce. People in Dayton knew it was a farce. They knew it was something silly to get attention, to get people into town for the weekend and all. They weren't taking this seriously. They were taken seriously elsewhere, of course. And then finally, there are a number of pictures of Brian's casket being taken out of town. He did die in Dayton, as I mentioned. And this is marvelously symbolic because it kills Brian, Dayton does. And I, I mentioned the great heat, he suffered from diabetes. He wasn't in great health here. And some of the other pictures, when you look at them, you see that Brian inevitably looks bad. He's uncomfortable. Of course, everybody's sweating because they're wearing overcoats and long sleeve shirts, uh, dress coats and long sleeve shirts in this 90 some degree weather. And I don't know how anyone can look comfortable in those, in those things. But Brian in particular looks uncomfortable. His shoulders are slumped, head tilted. Time and again, he looks in terrible shape. Darrell looks hot too, but he still stands up. He's pretty rigid. He's got that fire in his eyes still. Not so for Brian. And that, that I believe, comes through in several of these pictures. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm confused by history and inherit the wind. Did, um, did Daryl skewer Brian on the witness chair and, and kind of hound him to death? Uh, that's the way it kind of came out in the movie, in the play. The, the, the movie, Inherit the Wind, is a gross historical inaccuracy. Of course, it's really about McCarthyism and intolerance. See, it comes out in 1960. So Inherit the Wind is the Scopes trial but it's McCarthyism more than Scopes. It's intolerance more that they're after. The Scopes trial was just a convenient, dramatic platform for that movie. Historically, it's, it's way out of its league as far as facts. They do get a couple of things right, not many in the movie in terms of history, but they're not concerned about getting history right. One of the things that gets, I suspect, fairly close is that skewering because they do use the trial transcripts there and Darrow really did rough Brian up on the stand that was the high point of the trial in fact now understand that Brian made a terrible mistake tactically even showing up the man hadn't been in a courtroom for 30 years and here he's going up against probably the best trial lawyer of the day, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Denny? Oh, yeah. uh, the man, it would be frightening to do that. I mean, that's, that's like uh, me trying to get in there and put my boxing skills up against a heavyweight champ of the era. It, no, you don't do that, but he did. And so when he got on the stand, Darrow was merciless. And I mentioned this earlier. This is where he asked, so you believe that um, Jonah was swallowed by a whale? and Brian tries to dodge it, a great fish. Oh, so he was swallowed by a great fish. You, you believe God made all of that happen? He said, I believe God can make all kinds of things happen. He can make a great fish, and he can make that fish swallow a man. He says, do you believe Joshua made the sun stand still? And again, Brian tries to dodge it. He tries to say, I believe that God can do what he wants to do. He's trying not to be a literalist. Darrow's not going to let him do that. And they get to the part about a rock, where I think in the movie it's got the uh, Darrow character standing there holding a rock. Scientists say this rock is millions of years old. And Brian tries to get off the hook with that line of, well, I'm more interested in the rock of ages than the ages of rocks. Tries to make light of it. Darrow's not going to let him. He says, no, you think this is, couldn't be more than 6,000 years old, right? That's the date that uh, the Bishop Usher has given us by looking at the genealogy in the Bible, about 4,004 B.C., about 9 a.m., right? And that's what Bishop Usher did uh, uh, say, in fact. Well, do you believe a day is 24 hours long 
at the time of creation. He, he tries to say, I'm, no, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that. A, a, a day can be however long God wants it to be. He says, but how can you have a day before there's an earth and a sun? Brian was not a literalist in that kind of sense of the word. But here he's on the spot because what does he do? Does he alienate that audience that's in front of him, the fundamentalist Christians, by saying, you know, I really don't believe in a seven-day creation, a seven 24-hour day creation. He didn't, but he wouldn't say that. He couldn't. Politically, he's just on the spot. That's where Darrow, I think, you've got the right word. He skewers him. And that, of course, puts the agenda up for fundamentalist creationism that we have to this day. I think that's a script that's been followed. Are there any more questions? Uh, I might have a question. Have you, have you studied uh, Darrow's career and what he, he was doing or what he, he was doing at this time or how this fit into to what he was trying to do? Well, not closely, but what Darrow was really... Darrow, of course, was a radical. He, he liked defending radical causes. But the real reason that he... Well, he had two reasons for actually wanting to come after this trial. Um, one was very personal, and that was Brian. He really didn't like Brian. And he saw here a chance to make a fool out of Brian. The reason he didn't like Brian was because he, brain, he, bl he blamed Brian for those losses by the Democratic Party in 96, 1896, 1900, and 1908. Uh, he thought that in the wake of Brian's peak years in politics, the Democratic Party had just lost the White House because of that man. Uh, whether or not that's true. The, and as I said, that's the personal reason. The other reason was that he wants, uh, th this is what he does. He defends the radical causes. So this was a good one for him. He wanted to go after something like this. Was this a, a trial by jury? And did you? It was a jury trial. And, and were there comments from the members of the jury with regard to why they voted as they voted? Well, l let me no, not on why they voted as they voted, but the um, motive for becoming a member of the jury was very clear. You get a front row seat. It was a crowded courtroom. Uh, some of you have probably been to Dayton, and as you can see, it's not a big courtroom. Of course, by the standards of that day, it's pretty fair size, but it was wall-to-wall -wall people. And so the best way to get in there and get right up front to hear these famous orators was to be a member of the jury. Well, Brian is looking for, obviously, people that he thinks will support his argument, which isn't hard to do in rural Dayton. Darrow is also looking for people that will support Brian's argument because he wants to lose and appeal. So that's why they end up picking uh, a bunch of people who really don't have any sympathy for the idea of evolution at all. Uh, Brian wants it, and so does Darrow. They want the same thing in the jury. People ignorant of evolution who want to convict Scopes. Um, you, uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, sort of the legacy of Scopes and some of the legislative acts in Tennessee, and you know that's going on in some other states too. But w would you comment a little bit about your impression of how or whether you still feel that the Scopes trial affects, taints, stains the image of the state of Tennessee today? You're really putting me on the spot here. Uh, me being a state, state employee uh, at the University of Tennessee, <laughs> I probably deserve it. Uh, you're really putting me on the spot here. Uh, me being a state, state employee uh, at the University of Tennessee, <laughs> I probably deserve it. Uh, state employee at the University of Tennessee. But yes, it does. Uh, it, it's still with us in substantial fashion. And it's been pointed